Welcome! In this video, we're going to start learning the basics of Haskell. For this and the next videos, I'll be closely following this nice online tutorial called Learn UA Haskell for Great Good, which you can find online at learnuahaskell.com. So I personally learned Haskell based on this tutorial, and I think it strikes a nice balance between sort of presenting the essentials but not being overly detailed. For this video, we'll be covering the material in the second chapter of Learn UA Haskell. So if you want a reference, um, you can check this out in parallel or after you watch the video. Okay, so here we are back in Visual Studio Code. So I've created a Haskell script called Basic Operations in which I'll uh, write down all the stuff we learned today. Now, as always, the first step in order to get Haskell set up is to start a terminal where we can run GHCI. As I showed you in the previous video, we can do this by clicking on Terminal and then clicking New Terminal. And that'll start a terminal at the project folder we're currently in in Visual Studio Code. Now, because I have this script in a subfolder of the project folder, I'd ideally like my working directory for the terminal to be the subfolder, so I don't always have to type in uh, these folders if I'm loading the script. Now, in order to open a terminal directly at a given subfolder of your project folder, you can also right click on that folder and then uh, select Open in Integrated Terminal, and that'll open up a terminal at that location. Also, you'll see all the previously opened terminal sessions here on the right. So you can see the one that I opened previously is still open, and I can delete it by clicking on the trash can there. Now, once I've opened a terminal at the location where my script is at, I can type in GHCI to get GHCI running. And now for the first part, we're basically going to be learning some stuff inside this interactive command line, but then we'll move over to the script uh, in order to uh, write our code. So the first thing we're going to look at is how to perform basic arithmetic in Haskell. This isn't super interesting, but it's essential because we'll be using numbers a lot, and so we need to know how to add and subtract them and so on. Basically here, the syntax is as you would expect. You can do things like add numbers by using the plus operator. So two plus six is eight. You can multiply numbers by using the star operator. So two times six is 12. Um, you can also subtract numbers by using the minus sign. Um, you see you get a negative number as a result. And we can divide numbers using this division slash symbol. And finally, we can exponentiate numbers by using this hat symbol. Now I've always put spaces between the numbers and the operator just to make things a bit more legible, but you don't have to do this. It also works if you directly do things like three times six. Now, sometimes it'll be necessary to insert brackets to make the order of operations clear. So if I want to first add, let's say I want to add two and three and then multiply the result by four, then I have to surround two plus three by brackets just as you would in usual arithmetic. So the result I get here is different than if I had uh, omitted the brackets. You see, I get a different number. The reason is that uh, the operators in Haskell have predefined binding strengths, and as is usual in arithmetic, times binds more strongly than addition. So in this case, where I omit the brackets, Haskell is interpreting this as uh, 2 plus, and then in brackets, 3 times 4, which also gives 14. So it's just that the times operator binds more strongly, so it's uh, executed first if uh, the order is ambiguous. Now, although the operator precedents are intuitive, I would always insert enough brackets in order to make things unambiguous. Um, I think that's a better strategy than relying solely on the predefined operator precedents. The final thing that I need to show you with arithmetic is how to do negative numbers. So if we type in just things like minus four, that's going to be fine. So Haskell recognizes this as a negative number. On the other hand, if I try to, let's say, multiply minus four times two like this, then Haskell will return an error. The reason is that this uh, minus sign is overloaded. So on the one hand, it's a unary operator which converts a number into a negative number. And on the other hand, it's also this operation of subtracting numbers from one another. And so the problem here is that Haskell doesn't really know what you're trying to do because this symbol here could be interpreted both as subtracting numbers but also as converting four to a negative number. And then Haskell is confused about what you're trying to do. So uh, in order to avoid this, you should always surround um, 
negative numbers by parentheses like this, and then everything works out fine. So here we're basically saying, okay, first you negate the number four, and then Haskell knows, okay, this is the, the operator which negates a number, and then we multiply the result by two, and that gives minus eight. All right, so that covers basic arithmetic. Next, let's move on to some basic logical operations, namely and, or, and not. So in Haskell, truth values are given as true and false, and they have to be capitalized. So if you would type true uh, without the capitalization, you would get an error because Haskell doesn't know what that is. Now we can combine truth values using these logical operators, uh, and, or, and not. So and is given by typing two ampersand symbols. For instance, true and true is true, whereas true and false is false. Uh, similarly, or is given by two vertical bars. So true or false is uh, true. Whereas if we look at false and uh, false or false, that'll be false. Finally, there's negation. So not false is true, whereas not true is false. Now again, as in the case of arithmetic, we could use these operators to build up more complex expressions by uh, using brackets. The final family of basic operations is given by comparison. For instance, we can ask whether five is equals to four. So equality is checked by using this double equal sign operator. And in this case, Haskell says correctly that five is not the same as four. Uh, however, five is the same as five. And similarly, there's a operator that checks for negated equality. So this is saying five is not equals to five. That's false because actually five is five. On the other hand, five is not equals to four. So this returns true. Now to memorize the syntax here, this should remind you of a equal sign that has been stricken through. And so th that's why we have this slash in front of the equal sign. Now, one common mistake is to forget to use double equals when you're actually trying to perform a comparison. Uh, the reason you can't just use a single equal sign is because the single equal sign is used for assignment. So when we're defining functions, um, we use single equals, but if we're trying to compare two objects, we have to use this double equals. Now, one thing that might be a bit unexpected is if you try to compare two objects that are not of the same type, for instance, if I want to check whether five is equal to true, Intuitively, you would probably say, no, that should be false. However, Haskell doesn't even return anything because um, comparison can only be used on objects of the same type. So in this case, trying to compare five with true returns an error because true and five aren't of the same type. A similar error arises if I try to perform another operation which isn't defined on objects of different types. For example, if I try to add true to five, I also get an error. Now, the reason for why this doesn't work will become clear once we learn more about how these functions are actually defined in Haskell and how Haskell's type system works. But for the moment, just be aware that you might intuitively think that if you compare two objects of different types and, well, they're of different types, you would expect a false return value. But in fact, this comparison isn't even defined in Haskell. In general, if in doubt, you should assume that Haskell is more strict about the types than you would expect. So in other languages, usually uh, types are coerced into one another. For instance, true might be interpreted as the number one if it's used in an arithmetic expression. So that happens in some languages. So in that case, five plus true would equal six. Now having this sort of loose operator behavior can be useful. But in Haskell, we would have to explicitly declare it if we wanted our function to behave in that way. More often than not, actually, if we're trying to compare five with true, um, we've made some mistake in our code. And actually, we didn't expect that the value we got for true was going to be a Boolean. And uh, in the case of Haskell, Haskell will catch these sort of errors at compile time and tell us that something strange is going on. On the other hand, if we really wanted to add five and true, we could define a function that does this. Um, but in that case, we'd have to be explicit about what we're doing. Now, there are cases where Haskell will coerce types by default. For instance, um, the number five and the number 5.0 um, are actually not of the same type. 
but in this case, we can actually compare them. We can check the type of an object in GHCI by typing colon t and then that object. So here we see that the type of five is this complicated num a and then this arrow a. This isn't actually a specific type. Rather, it's like a larger class of types called a type class in Haskell. And similarly, um, 5.0 also doesn't have a specific type, rather has this broad type class called fractional. So the reason this comparison works in this case is because actually if we're inputting numbers into GHCI, we're not committing yet to what type those numbers are. And so there's some wiggle room there and therefore we can coerce things to make them the same. On the other hand, I can actually force Haskell to make five an integer. So if I type in five and then double colon int, well, it just outputs five again. But if I check the type of this new uh, number, we see that actually uh, this has uh, type int. So now if I wanted to compare something that I explicitly declared to be an integer with 5.0, which now I'm explicitly declaring to be of type double, then you see I get an error because these things now have specific types and the types don't match and therefore the comparison doesn't work as when we try to compare five with true. Now, if this doesn't make a lot of sense to you yet, don't worry about it. We'll see a lot more about this when we talk about types in Haskell. But I just wanted to warn you that somehow numbers are kind of treated more generally um, when you just type them into GHCI than other types of objects would be. All right, so, so far we've seen a bunch of operators and in fact, they've all been defined in terms of an infix notation. So what I mean by this is that we write things like three plus four and well, plus can be thought of as a function that takes two arguments, but the first argument is uh, before the operator and then the second argument is after the operator. This is in fact not the usual way that functions will look in Haskell. A more typical function will look like this, for example, the minimum function, which takes two numbers and returns the smaller value. So here we see that in contrast to the plus operator, we're writing the name of the function first, then we follow it by its arguments separated by spaces. This is in fact the default notation for functions. So we have the name of the function and then we have a space and then we put the argument separated by spaces. This might look a little weird if you're familiar with other programming languages, which use brackets and commas to separate the arguments. So in other languages like Python, applying the function min to the three and four might look like this. However, Haskell kind of gets rid of all of this unnecessary notational baggage. Um, so it's very minimalist in that sense. So we can just uh, write down the argument separated by a space. Now, sometimes it'll be useful to apply um, operators which are defined as being infix, like the plus operator. It's going to be useful to also be able to apply those as a prefix operator. And the way you do this is you surround them by parentheses like so. So if I do plus surrounded by parentheses and then three and four, then this will change the infix operator plus into a prefix type function. And so this is the same as if I just write three plus four. Okay, so to convert an infix function into a prefix function, you surround them by parentheses. And conversely, it's possible to convert prefix functions into infix functions by surrounding them by backticks. For instance, I can apply the min function uh, as sort of a infix operator. And the way I'm going to do that is I'm going to surround it by backticks. So three min four like this surrounded by backticks is the same as typing in min three four. Now in this case, this doesn't make things a lot more readable. So the reason why certain things are defined infix and certain things prefix is basically just for legibility. For instance, you wouldn't wanna write out an entire arithmetic expression using just prefix notation, that's way too hard to read. But here with a minimum function, it makes sense to have the name first. So you're taking the minimum of three and four, that's more legible than saying three, I'm taking the minimum of four or something like that. That doesn't really read that nicely. Now, whether a function is prefix or infix can be defined when you're creating the function. Now in the standard Haskell library, certain things are just defined to be prefix and certain infix, and usually it makes sense. There are, however, cases like with um, the lm function, which we'll see later, which checks whether a certain element is in the list, 
where oftentimes it's better to use it in fix despite it being by default defined as a prefix function. Another function from the standard library that is defined prefix but is often more legible if you use infix is div. So div is integer division, which means that we're basically dividing without a remainder. For instance, if I div 40 by 9, you can see I get 4. Why is this? Well, if I did like a proper long division and I divided 40 by 9, I would get 4, but I also get a remainder of 4. Now div just kind of throws away the remainder term and gives you how many times does 9 fit into 40. But here it's actually more legible if I write 40 and then do the back ticks and write div 9 like this. That's equivalent to what I wrote above, but in this case it's clearer that I'm dividing 40 by 9. With that out of the way, we can now move on to the bread and butter of Haskell programming, which is defining functions. So I'm going to start out with a very simple example, which is called double me. And the definition is double me x is equal x plus x. Here we see how to define functions with arguments in Haskell. So first we put the name of our function, which is called double me. Now for the name, we can use any sort of alphabetical sequence with the restriction that the first letter of the sequence is lowercase. Now, as a matter of convention, we'll be using camel case, which means that whenever we want to kind of start a new word in the name of a function, we'll put a capital letter there. Next, after the name, we put all the arguments that the function will have. In this case, it just has one argument, namely x, and these arguments need to be separated by spaces. And then we have this equals, which is the assignment operator for functions. So this is like what's going to define the function. And to the right of that, we're going to put the definition of the function, which is basically like the return value. So here this function is going to take an x and it's going to return x plus x. Okay, so let's give this a test. So I save the script and now I'm going to load um, this basic operations.hs into uh, the Haskell GHCI. So remember that loading is done by uh, typing colon L and then the name of the file you're trying to load. Now, since I've already opened the terminal in this folder in which the file is located, I can just type the file name. So far, so good. We see that um, here I have uh, this message which says compiling main and then it says, okay, one module loaded. So the file has compiled fine. And now this function double me should be in memory. So I can type, for example, double me three and I get back six, which is what I would expect, or I could do double me 11, I get back 22 and so on. Okay, now let's define a second function, namely one which takes two arguments. So this is going to be called double us, and it's going to have two arguments, x and y. And the idea is I'm going to double x and then add the result to twice y, like so. So here, basically the same thing is happening as above. Just in this case, we have two arguments. So here you can see when we give the function two arguments, we just need to separate them by spaces. Now Visual Studio Code is giving me sort of typing suggestions for both of these functions. So that's what Haskell thinks that the type of this function should be. We can ignore that for the moment. In future, when we define functions, once we know how to you know, interpret types properly, we'll also be um, defining the typing information whenever we define a function, but for now we're just going to ignore that aspect. Okay, so now that I have this function defined, I'm going to again save the result. And now in order to access it, I need to reload my script. So I'm going to type colon R for reload, or alternatively I could just do again uh, load then the script name, but reload like this is faster. I see that it's again compiled, which is good because that means that probably there's no mistakes in there. And then I can test this function. So I'm going to type double us three and four. And I see that the result is 14, which is what you expect if you would um, add two times three plus two times four. So that's six plus eight. Okay, so we've got this double us function up and running. And uh, we could now sort of criticize this definition here um, by saying that we're kind of doing something uh, we've done in the first function, this double me again, namely we're doubling each of these numbers and then adding the result. 
So in fact, an equivalent way of writing this program would be to use the previously defined double me function on x and y in order to sort of get rid of this redundancy. So I could type uh, double me x here and double me y here. So we know that double me x will double x. So that's the same as before when I had two times x written there and uh, double me y will double y and then I add the result. So if I save and reload the script and uh, rerun this command double us 3, 4, we see that I also get 14. So I get the same result as before, but now in this case, I've defined double us by referencing the previously defined function double me. And in fact, this is how we'll be building up complex programs from easier ones. We'll be defining some simple functions and then we'll be using those simple functions to create more complicated functions and so on. Okay, the next example of a function we'll see will use an if statement. So it's called double small number, and it's just going to take a single number x. And well, if the number is small, we're going to double it, and otherwise we're going to leave it as it is. So first I'm going to check whether x is greater than 100. And well, if this is the case, then I'm going to just return the number, and otherwise, if it's smaller or equal than 100, I'm going to return 2 times x instead. Now, here is a case where the auto formatting will be useful. So, in order to write these if then statements, um, we can write them across multiple lines. So, we have this if on the top, and then we have these two clauses, then and else. But in order for it to work properly, then and else need to have the same indentation level. So let's see what the auto formatting does here if I apply it. You see it moves the entire if then else statement to a new line, which uh, makes things maybe a bit more legible. Also, if I had somehow messed up the indentation like this with the if then else, if I would format it, you see it automatically puts it so that it's in the same block. Remember that you can find the corresponding keyboard shortcut for auto formatting by um, going to the help here and searching for keyboard shortcuts and then going to the settings for the keyboard shortcuts and then uh, searching for format. Okay, so let's test out this new function using this if then else construct. So again, uh, the if then else construct has an if then it has some condition and if that condition is fulfilled, then the then clause is executed. And otherwise, if the statement here is false, then the else clause uh, will be in effect. Okay, so I've again saved my script, I'm now reloading it, and I'm now trying out this uh, double small uh, number function. So let's see what happens if I do double small number two. We see that the small number two is doubled, whereas if I do double small number 102, uh, nothing happens, so it just returns 102 because uh, 102 is strictly greater than 100, so we're in this first case here. Now, rather than using this sort of block indented notation, it's actually possible to write um, this if then else clause in a single line. The reason for this is that this if then else construct here is just an expression like uh, any other type of expression in Haskell, so it evaluates to a specific value. So if I save this and I reload the script and I recall the function, you see it has exactly the same behavior as before. Um, the downside of putting everything in one line is that it's maybe less readable, especially if you're going to be doing other stuff with the uh, uh, value afterwards. So I'm going to reformat this in the format it was before. So I'll put these on separate lines. I'll do the auto formatting and then uh, this appears as a block like so. Okay, so we've seen an example of a function taking one argument, we've seen an example of a function taking two arguments, and here we've seen an example of this if-then-else construct, which will be very useful in what follows. We can also define functions that don't take any arguments at all, so they're just constants. And in fact, if we wanted to you know, write uh, these operations I had before, like 3 times 2 in a script, we would actually have to define them as a constant function. For instance, I can define 7 equals 3 plus 4, like so, 
and well, this is a totally valid function. It's just one that doesn't take any arguments whatsoever. So if I reload and type in seven, I return seven, which is the result of evaluating the expression three plus four. Similarly, I could replace this here with some other type of uh, value. For example, I could replace it with the string, which states seven. So in this case, seven here is a function and it has a constant value, namely this string seven. So if I reload and type in seven, it returns this uh, string seven. Okay, so here we've seen some examples of some basic functions. So I'm going to add this as a heading. By the way, if I put these two uh, minus signs here, that starts a comment in the script. So Haskell will ignore the line starting with two minus signs. So these are basic functions. Okay, and now let's move on to the next topic, which is going to be lists. And uh, well, lists will be super important. We'll be using them all the time. In fact, it'll be like the default data structure we'll go to because uh, in Haskell, there's these nice functional idioms for like iterating over lists and applying functions to lists and so on. Now to demonstrate some of the operators we can use on lists, I'm again going to uh, move to the terminal here. So lists are defined by square brackets and then putting the elements of the list inside separated by commas. So this would be a valid list in this case of numbers. Uh, lists can contain any sort of uh, type. So I could have a list which contains the values true and uh, the value false. That's also a valid list. In this case, it's a list of Booleans. However, lists are a homogeneous data structure, which means that all the types in the list have to be the same. So for instance, a list consisting of five and true will result in an error because five and true don't have the same type. And so we can't put both of them into a list. Now the most basic operation on lists is concatenation. So let's say I have these two lists, then I can concatenate them by using the plus plus operator. So this returns a new list, which is just the two starting lists placed side by side. As you might expect, if I have lists which let's say one list which is a list of numbers and another one which is a list of booleans, I can't concatenate them because the resulting list would have different types in it and that's uh, not allowed as we saw before. Okay, so concatenation uh, nation is, uses this plus plus operator. In fact, we can also concatenate strings. So if I, let's do a hello plus and then world like this, that will give me a new string which is the two strings just put side by side. Note that here I included the space in order to get the space here in the final word. In fact, in Haskell, strings are also just lists, namely lists of single characters. So a character in Haskell is surrounded by single quotes. So H surrounded in single quotes, this is a character, whereas H surrounded in double quotes is a list of characters. It's just a singleton list in this case. So these two things are distinct. For instance, if I check whether h with the single quotes is equal to h with the double quotes, I get an error because again, these can't be compared. Here it's complaining and it's actually telling us what the problem is. On the one hand, we have a list of characters occurring here on the right, which is symbolized by these square brackets around character. So that's the type of this thing. Whereas on the other side, we just have a character. On the other hand, if we surround this uh, character h here, so the one in the single quotes with the square bracket. So now this is a list containing a single character. This is in fact the same as if we just uh, have the string H. Or more generally, we could check whether um, things like this. So he, this is in fact the same as if we just type the string uh, he in double quotes. So this double quote notation here is basically just an abbreviation in Haskell for this more complicated object here, namely a list of single characters. And therefore, because it's just an abbreviation, we can also apply all of the operators and functions we have for lists to strings. They just operate on the strings as if they were lists of characters. Another important operator for list is the so-called cons operator. So to explain this, it's probably best just to give an example. And the cons operator is this colon. So if I do five cons, then let's say six, seven, eight, the result is five, six, seven, eight, as in one big list. 
So this basically kind of appends the, the five to the start of the list. So the list five, six, seven, eight in Haskell like this is in fact the same thing as five colon six colon seven colon eight colon and then the empty list. So I start with the empty list and I append eight to the front then I append seven to the front then six to the front and then five to the front. So lists are somehow built up by iteratively appending elements to the front of them, and that's exactly what this cons operator does. And in fact, we'll see that in the type definition for lists, we actually define lists in terms of an empty list and some series of these cons operations. So there's this cons operator, which now I have a problem because it's actually itself given by a colon, so cons is defined by this colon here. Another thing we can do with lists is we can get specific elements from the list. So if I have, say, the word hello, then I can use this uh, double exclamation mark operator here to get a specific element of the list. So in this case, I get the third element, which is L. Now, uh, importantly, indexing starts at zero. So H here is actually the zeroth element of the list, and the first element is actually E. Okay, so to get an index, I can use this uh, double exclamation mark operator. Now, of course, I can also nest lists. So I could have a list containing two lists. And in this case, I'll have two lists containing uh, some, some numbers. And well, this thing is a well-defined object. It's a list of list of numbers. Now, remember that lists have to be homogeneous. So if I were to put some list of truth values here instead of a list of numbers, this gives me an error. Why is this? Well, this thing is a list of Boolean values and this thing is a list of numbers. So those two things themselves have different types so they can't coexist together in a single list. The final thing that's maybe useful to know is that lists can also be compared, not just using the equality operator, but also using um, these inequality operators. So this works as long as the elements of the list themselves can be compared using inequalities. For instance, the list one, two, if I check whether this is strictly less than two, two, that evaluates as true. Whereas uh, if I change this here to, let's say three, two, then three, two is not strictly less than two, two. Okay, so maybe that makes sense. And now let's see what happens here. So I compare, let's say, 1, 3 with 2, 2. That also evaluates to true. In fact, what's going on here is that lists can be compared using lexicographic order, also known as dictionary order. So the way this ordering works is that first you look at the first elements of both lists and then compare those. So if they're different, you just use um, the ordering on those to compare the lists. For instance, here, 1 is strictly less than 2. So regardless of what uh, happens later in the list, this will evaluate to true, whereas here three is not strictly less than two, so this evaluates to false. On the other hand, if the two first elements are actually the same, then we move on to the second elements and so on. So this is like if you wanted to look up the order of words in a dictionary. First you look at the first letter, and if the two first letters are the same, then you look at the second letter and so on. For instance, if I have here the first two uh, things being the same, so I have two, three, and two, two. Well, in this case, the first two are the same, but now the second elements here, we see that three is not strictly less than two, so this re returns false. Whereas if I had it ordered in the other direction, I would get true. Okay, moving on, there is a long list of functions which can be applied to lists. So let's look at the first series, which is head, tail, last, and init. So let's see what this does based on the example of hello. So let's see what head of hello is. We see that it's the character H. So head will always return the first element of a list. Now there's a bit of a problem with the default definition of head, which is if we give head an empty list, we actually get an exception. So there's like uh, an error occurring here, which is sort of a problem in the default definition of head. So we always need to make sure that whenever we use the head function, that we make sure that the list is not empty, that we're passing to the function. 
In fact, we'll see a way later how to redefine this head function in order to avoid this problem by using the maybe type. Okay, moving on, let's see what the other um, functions that I wrote down do. So if we do tail of hello, I get hello. So that's the entire list except for this first element. So you see I'm returning again a string, which is a list of characters, and I've just removed the first element. The next function um, that we're looking at is called last. So if I do last of hello, I get the character O. So last just gives me the last element of the list. So it's like the head function, except it returns the last element of the list. And finally, there's init, which is sort of like tail, except reversed. So init gives me the initial segment of a list. So that's everything except for the last thing occurring in the list. Then there are several more functions which are very useful for lists. So one's called length. The other one's called null, and there's reverse, and take, and drop. So let's see what these do. So let's check what the length of hello is. Well, you would expect it to be actually the length of it, which is true, so it returns five. Next, let's see what null does. So null of hello is false, whereas null of the bracket, so the empty list is true. So null just checks whether a list is empty or not. And in fact, we can use null to um, check whether a list is empty or not before applying the head function. So we could avoid uh, the error that we got before. Then there's another uh, function whose name is self-explanatory, which is reverse. So this just reverses the order of the list. And finally, we have these take and drop functions. So take uh, has two arguments. The first argument needs to be an integer and the second one a list. So take for hello is hell. So it takes the first four elements of the list and drops the rest. So uh, for example, take two, hello would just be he, and so on. You can also take zero. Uh, the result is the empty string, which is equivalent to the empty list. Now drop works in a similar fashion. So drop will remove um, elements of the list. So here drop two, hello, removes the first two elements of the list and just returns the what remains. So here if I drop zero hello, I don't do anything, I just return hello. Whereas if I drop five hello, I return the empty string because I've removed all of the elements. Okay, then the next grouping of uh, functions that are useful are maximum, uh, minimum, uh, then sum and product. So here it's probably best to use numbers because we need to be able to add and multiply things so let's uh, create a list of numbers. Let's say one, two, three. Okay, so now I can ask for the maximum of this list. That just returns the largest element in the list. Similarly, uh, minimum returns the smallest element. Uh, sum will add together all the elements in the list, which in this case will give six, whereas product will multiply together all the elements in the list, which by a coincidence here also gives six. Okay, and now the final uh, useful function we'll need is called lm, which checks whether a given element is contained in a list. For instance, if I type in lm4 and then this list which contains four, one, two, four, I get true. Whereas if I have a list that doesn't contain four, then I return false. So as you can see, lm is a function with two arguments. The first argument is the thing we're checking, whether it's in the list, and the second argument needs to be a list. Now this is in fact one of those cases where it's more legible to write this function as an infix operator. So to do this, we do for, and then we do lm in backticks, and then we uh, define our list, like one, two, four, like so. And this is the same as calling lm for and then the list. But in this case, we can read it as is for an element of this list which is more legible than uh, this notation here. Okay, so that gives you an overview of the most important list functions. I'm aware that it's maybe not so interesting just to see all of these at once, but uh, these are so important that basically we should know them from the start because we're going to be using them all the time. Now, typing out lists of numbers is not so interesting. So Haskell actually provides nice syntax to make our lives easier, which are ranges. 
So that's the next thing we'll look at. So ranges allow us to specify lists without having to type out all the numbers. So the way you define a range, in this case, let's say the range from one to 20 is by using these two dots. So I do one dot dot 20, and this will give me a list of all the numbers between one and 20. Now, in order for this to work, um, the objects that we're putting in our range have to have some sort of enumeration on them. Uh, luckily, there are many objects that do. So for example, I can also get all the letters from A to Z by typing in this range. So here I have the character A and here I have the character Z. And now I form a range from character A to character Z. And well, that's what I obtain. Now the same thing works for capital letters, but in fact, if you uh, try to do the range from capital A to small z, you'll see what the ordering on characters is. Namely, we start with all the capital letters, then there's these uh, special characters, and then uh, we have the uh, small uh, letters occurring. Now it's possible to also create ranges using steps other than one. And the way to do this is to start off your range with the first two numbers in your sequence, then type dot dot, and then type the last number you want to include. For instance, if I type in brackets 0 comma 2 dot dot 20, I get a list of numbers going from 0 to 20 and steps of 2. Now, in fact, this notation kind of uses arithmetic progressions, which means that you just specify the first two numbers. So I could, for example, specify 4 comma 8. So that's the first two um, elements of my sequence, and then I give the last number, which should be uh, included. So here you see um, I get a sequence which is starts with 4, 8, just as I declared here in the range. But then it progresses with the same step size, so with step size 4, um, up until um, a number that is less than or equal to this final value I specified. So in this case, if I would have taken another step of 4, I would have got 24, which is larger than the, the final value here in this range that I would include. So 24 is no longer included, but 20 is. And we see in this example here, in the case where the final value is actually reached by the designated step size, then you also include it. Now you might wonder what happens if we don't specify a final value. Let's say I do 0 and then dot dot. Well, this is in fact going to give me an infinite list. So you can see my computer starts computing all the numbers and well, it's never going to finish. So in this case, I can try to run a keyboard interrupt. And the way to do that here in on Mac is to type control C and well, that'll interrupt whatever was running now. Okay, so as you can see, if we don't specify an upper bound for a range, we actually produce an infinite list which just keeps going on. Now, the way to avoid uh, your computer uh, like not terminating the task is just to use take. So I could do, for example, take 30 of this infinite uh, list here, and I just take the first 30 elements of it and everything stays finite and is fine. Now, some functions will actually produce infinite lists. One example is cycle. So if I do cycle of an existing uh, list, for example, hello. So this will just repeat the list over and over again, and it'll never terminate. Uh, so again, I should keyboard interrupt out of this. Uh, again, the way to avoid uh, this is to take a certain amount of elements. So I can take 30 of uh, cycle hello. And this will just take the first 30 elements of this infinite uh, list, which just says hello, 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 and so on. A similar function is repeat. So repeat in contrast to cycle uh, doesn't take a list, but takes a single element, for instance, three. So uh, repeat three will build an infinite list just consisting of threes. So if I take the first 30 elements of that list, it's just a list containing threes. Now, if you're not familiar with Haskell, um, this sort of thing might seem a bit weird. So we're actually defining these infinite structures, but then we're just like taking certain finite number of elements from them. So the reason this works in Haskell is because evaluation in Haskell is lazy, which means that Haskell doesn't actually evaluate the expression, so the, the infinite list you're defining, until it actually needs to. So in this case, Haskell is totally fine with you defining an infinite list, 
as long as you don't force it to actually like list the entire list, for example, by printing it. This will turn out to be really useful because we can define infinite data structures and then just sort of take some initial segments of those whenever we want. Our next topic is called list comprehension, which is another feature that makes our lives much easier when we work with lists. So like ranges, list comprehensions will allow us to build lists of objects, um, but unlike ranges, they're much more expressive. I think it's easiest just to start with an example. So the following list comprehension uh, works as follows. So we write two times x, where x ranges in the following list, namely the numbers between one and 10. Okay, if I evaluate this, you see I get even numbers going from two to 20. Now let's try to understand what's going on here. So in this list comprehension, which itself is surrounded by these square brackets, I have two parts. So I have this vertical line appearing here, and then I have a part that occurs to the left of the vertical line and the part that occurs to the right. So in the right part, I'm giving all of the values over which x ranges in the comprehension. So in this case, x can take all the values between one and 10. And then on the left-hand side, I'm telling Haskell what to do with these x's that live in, in this set here. So in this case, I'm multiplying each of the values that x can take by two. So the way this works is that first x assumes the first value it can assume, namely one. And then in the resulting list, I calculate two times x, which is in this case, two times one. So I put two as the first element of the resulting list. Next, x will take on the next value it can assume, which is two. And in this case, I multiply two times two and I get four as the next element of this list comprehension. And I do this up until the value 10, which is the last value that x can assume. I multiply that by two and I get to 20. So this notation is very similar to the set builder notation you might know from math. In this case, you say, these are all the types of elements I'm interested in where x lies in this set. But in this case, this is not a set, it's a list. In a similar manner, let's do another example. So I could have x being either one, three, or five. And then instead of multiplying x by two, I'm going to add one to x. And the result will be a list of three elements, namely two, four, and six. These are all elements of the form x plus one, where x assumes uh, one of these three values. So basically this is the same as adding one to each element of this list over here. Okay, so now let's check your comprehension of list comprehension in the following exercise. So uh, let's try to generate the following list using list comprehension. So it's a list which should contain the following words, e, hi, and let's say ho. So we want to create this by list comprehension. So create this list by list comprehension. So if you have a GHCI open, you can try this out for yourself. If not, I would really suggest you try to figure this out on your own. Um, otherwise, if it's somehow impossible for you to open GHCI at the moment, you can also think about theoretically what you would type in in order to get this list. Now I'm going to give you a hint first. So if you don't want to hear the hint, you should pause the video now. So the hint for this is that we notice that um, in this list, the thing that's varying is this vowel here, whereas this H is the same in all of the elements of the list. And similarly down here, uh, the thing that's varying is actually uh, the thing occurring to the right of this bar in the list comprehension. And the other hint I'll give you is that you should remember that there's a difference between strings, which are surrounded by double quotes, and characters, which are surrounded by single quotes. So strings are lists of characters. Okay, so again, if you want to solve this on your own, you should pause the video. I'm now going to proceed to the solution. So in fact, there's several possible solutions. Uh, here's one. So the hint I gave before suggests that we should have the variable x run in the following set of vowels, namely e, i, and o. So one option is to have these be characters. 
So I could have the list of characters E, I, and O, like so. And in this case, well, if I don't do anything with these characters and I just do uh, the list comprehension X, where X lies in this list of characters, well, I'll just get back the original list of characters, which in this case is interpreted as a string. Okay, so I have the varying behavior of X uh, that, that's working out, but now I need to do something with X, namely I need to create these strings, he, hi, and ho, and in order to do this, well, I'm going to remember that a string is just a list of characters. So this thing here, he, is a list which has as its first element the character h, and as its second element the character e. And well, in our, my list comprehension, e is the first value that x assumes. So I want to create lists where the first element of the list is always the letter h, and the second element of the list is always going to be x, so the character uh, either e, i, or o. So if I do this, then I see that in fact I get the desired list. So this thing here is the same as a string with the first character being h and the second one x, so that's either e, i, or o. And now I'm creating a list of all these possibilities. So I get he, hi, ho, as intended. Now maybe this thing here doesn't look uh, so intuitive, like it's not super clear that we're trying to create strings and so on. So another possibility would be to use concatenation to create uh, the strings we're interested in. So we could think about concatenating the string h with x. However, if I uh, just write it down like this, this won't work. The reason for this is that here we have a string, so that's a list of characters, whereas x uh, is now just a single character and we can't in general concatenate the string with a single character. So to fix this, I need to modify the values that x ranges over and make those values themselves lists. So in this case, they are lists just containing the single characters. And if I do that, then everything works out fine because I can concatenate a string h with a string e to get he and so on. Okay, so I hope that uh, this example is clear and that hopefully in trying to mess around a bit with list comprehensions you learn something. Now in fact list comprehensions are even more useful than we've seen so far. We can actually also include certain conditions to filter the resulting list that we get. For instance consider the example of the comprehension I had before. So all of the value is 2 times x where x ranges um, be between the numbers 1 and 10. Now in this list comprehension so on the right hand side of this bar, I can now also include a condition separated by a comma. And in this case, the condition I'm going to include is called even x. And let's see what the result is. So before in the comprehension without the condition, I got all even numbers between two and 20. But now in this comprehension, we can see that I'm only getting certain even numbers between two and 20 namely 4, 8, 12, 16, and 20. And the reason for this is that I'm filtering the comprehension, so I'm only selecting those x's from 1 uh, to 10 that are actually even. So even x, so the function even checks whether a number is even. For instance, even 2 is true, but even 3 is false. So what's happening in this comprehension is that, well, first x assumes the value 1, then the comprehension checks whether the condition holds. In this case, it doesn't, so it won't uh, add whatever result of this operation to the list. The next value x can assume is 2. In this case, even x is true, so everything's fine, and we'll multiply 2 by 2, so we'll include 2x to the resulting list, so that gets 4. Next, x will assume 3. We again check whether the condition holds. In this case, it doesn't hold, so we move on to the next x, and so on. And in the last case, x is 10. Uh, this is indeed even, so it's included into the list, so we multiply 10 by 2 and include the result in the list comprehension. Now, as you can see, this, this function here, so the condition needs to have to do with x. Now, sometimes we'll be interested, actually, in filtering these values, so filtering by some property of these values, but uh, that's actually also not so hard because, for instance, we can check, uh, we can just put like 2 times x here, and then we can put some condition on 2 times x. 
So for instance, if I wanted all the even numbers between two and 20, but I only for some reason wanted ones that were, let's say strictly less than 15, well then I could put that as a condition here. And now I get all even numbers between two and 20 that are strictly less than 15. So I get a list two, four, and so on up to 14. Now we can also include multiple conditions by separating them by commas. So let's say I wanted to keep the original condition I had here with two X being strictly less than 15. But for some reason, I also want to get rid of 10 from the resulting list. Then I could say that I want two X to not equal 10. And in that case, I get the same result as from the previous list comprehension, except that uh, 10 has been removed. So I don't have 10 in the second one. The reason is that, well, when it comes to checking uh, the value of X being five here, so when X assumes the value of five, then two X is 10, which when I compare it with, with 10 and I want it to be not the same returns false, so that uh, X will be skipped. So in other words, um, only X's are included in the comprehension, which satisfy all the predicates, so all of these conditions that come afterwards. Now, a second thing we can do, instead of adding more conditions, we can also add more variables. So instead of just having a variable X, I could also include a variable Y. Let's say Y also ranges between uh, one and 10. And now I want to, in my list comprehension, calculate the value of X times Y. So this will basically give me like a multiplication table. You see here first, the values start one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. And so that's when I keep Y at one and I range over X between one and 10. And then Y moves to the value two. And then I go through all the X values again. So here you see uh, I have two, four, six, eight, and so on up to 20. In all of these values, y is equal to two and x ranges over one to 10, then y becomes three. And we iterate through, uh, through all of this until in the last uh, iterate where we have numbers 10, 20, 30, and so on. In this case, y is 10 and we move through x ranging from one to 10. So to make this more clear, I can also, uh, instead of multiplying the two numbers, I could um, put a pair here. We'll see more on pairs later, but uh, this is just a pair of numbers. So we see that the way that this list comprehension works, if I like explicitly list out all the pairs, we see that the first value is staying constant. So this is the X value and that the Y value is uh, first ranging through all the things we give here. Uh, and then X is incremented by one. So we see after Y has gone through all of its possibilities, X becomes two and then y goes through all of the possibilities again and so on. So here you can see the result of this comprehension is basically the Cartesian product between uh, these two lists here. Okay, let's uh, test our understanding by doing another exercise. So I want to write a function that uh, removes uh, all vowels from a string. And I want to do this using list comprehension. So again, remember that the strings are just lists, so we can modify and create them using list comprehensions. So I again suggest that you pause the video and try this out for yourself. In this case, we're trying to write a function, so it's probably best to do this in a script. Okay, so I hope you've tried this for yourself. I'm now going to present one possible solution. So I'm going to define a function called remove vowels. And this is going to operate on some string, which I'm going to call X's because I'm going to think about this string as a list. And now its return value is going to be defined using a list comprehension. So I've already got this set up here. And well, the idea is I want to look at all the letters. So I'll have some uh, variable, which I call letter and well, the letters are going to come from the original string, which was called X's. So this variable letter will range over this original string X's. So it'll assume one after the other, each character in the string. And basically I just want to not do anything with a letter afterwards. So I'm just going to return the letter uh, in this list. 
but I want to make sure that it's not a vowel. So I'm going to add a condition which checks whether this letter is a vowel or not. Now one way to do this is just by defining a list of vowels and checking whether letter is an element of that list or not. Okay, so for this I define a list which has all the vowels in it. So A, E, uh, I, O, uh, U, and sometimes Y. So we'll include Y as being a vowel. And now I want to check in this condition whether or not letter is an element. So if letter is an element of this, and remember in order to check whether something is an element of the list, we can use this LM function. In this case, I'm using it with infix notation. So now as it stands, this condition here checks whether letter belongs to this list or not. Now the problem is that I actually want the opposite. So I want that letter is not an element of this list of vowels. So in order to do that, I just include not here. So I negate whatever the result of this um, statement is here. Okay. So to review, we define this function called remove vowels. It takes in some string, which I call x's. Now the output of this function will be defined in terms of this list comprehension. So the letters um, that I'll output into my new list, which will form a string, uh, come from the original string x's. And I only want to include those letters. So I just, here in this comprehension, don't do anything with the letters, but I do check a condition, namely that uh, the letter is not an element of this list of vowels. Okay, so let's see whether this works. So I save, and now I'm going to load this script, uh, basic operations.hs. Okay, so luckily it's compiled. And now I can check whether remove vowels does actually what I wanted. So I'll try to remove the values of the word hello. And we see that uh, indeed it works. So it gives me back this string HLL, which is this original string with all the vowels removed. Now, as you can see, this list comprehension here got quite long. In fact, it got so long that it's not going to fit on one line with the font size I'm using. This is always an indication that you can do better. So to split this up into two smaller functions, I'm going to notice that here in this part, I'm basically just checking whether a thing is a vowel or not. So this can be separated out into a new function called isVowel. So I'm going to call this isVowel letter. And we notice that this thing here, which I wrote down is exactly checking whether a thing is a vowel or not. So I can just paste that in up here into the definition of this isVowel function. Okay. And now down here, um, I have to, well, use the function I've defined above. So I'm going to say uh, is vowel letter, okay? So whenever possible, it's always a good idea to split things up into very simple functions. Um, this has the advantage that it makes the code more readable as well. In this case, now this list comprehension becomes a lot nicer. So it's saying that remove vowels x's is equal to all the letters where the letters range through uh, the original string x's, but with the condition that it's not the case that is vowel letter, so it's not the case that that letter is a vowel. Okay, so to test this, I'm going to save my script, I'll reload it, and I'll check whether remove vowels still does what I want. So I'm going to again remove vowels, hello, and indeed I get the same result because basically I've just replaced this longer expression using this function here, which I defined. Okay, so the final topic we'll see in this video are tuples. We already encountered those briefly before when I showed you how to enumerate all the pairs where x and y were running between one and 10. So tuples are defined with these round brackets, but otherwise they're sort of like lists. So we can construct tuples by yeah, surrounding, well, sequences of elements with these round brackets and separating the elements by commas. Now in contrast to lists, tuples can actually contain different types. So three, four, true is a valid tuple, but it's not a valid list. It's also possible to create lists of tuples, of course, but again, we need to make sure that all the tuples have the same type. So uh, here in this example, this works because both of these are tuples of length two containing numbers. On the other hand, 
if I try something like this, I get an error. So here the problem is that one of the tuples is a tuple of length two containing numbers and the other one is a tuple where the first element is a number and the second one is a Boolean value. So the types of this tuple here and this one are different because at the second position, this one contains a number and this one contains a Boolean. Similarly, it's not possible to create a list uh, where the tuples occurring in the list have different lengths. The reason again is that the type of this tuple and this one are different. In this case, it's not because the components are different. In this case, it's because they have a different number of components. We'll now see three functions which will be useful for working with tuples. The first one is called first, and the second one will be called second. So whenever we have tuples of length two, like three and four, then we can use first to get the first element of the tuple, in this case three, and we can use second, which is abbreviated SND, to get the second element. So first and second are like projections onto the first and the second element of a tuple respectively. Be careful, however, that uh, these operations only work for tuples of length two. So if we try to do second on this tuple of length three, it won't work. And similarly, if we try to do first on a tuple of length three, I mean, you might expect that this should give you three back, but in fact, it results in an error because this function here is only defined on tuples of length two. So another way to call tuples of length two are pairs. So first and second only operate on pairs. Okay, so we have here first and uh, second, they operate on pairs. The final function we'll see for tuples is called zip. So zip takes two lists as arguments. Um, for example, the list, let's say two, 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 and the list three, four, five, okay? And what it produces is a list containing pairs um, of elements. So what it does is it puts the two first elements of these lists in a pair, and then it puts the two second elements of the lists in a pair, and so on until it reaches the end of one of the lists. So zip also works if we have uh, lists that aren't the same length, but in this case, it'll just stop whenever it reaches the end of one of the lists. For instance, here it, it reaches the end of the first list, so it stops and it doesn't do anything with these last elements in the second list. And similarly, if we had some additional elements occurring in the first list, zip would just ignore them because the second list stops. Okay, so zip somehow provides a natural way of combining two lists into a new list by creating a list of pairs where we just kind of match up each of the indices of the two starting lists. To see how this could be useful, let's do another exercise. So the idea here is we want to create um, a list that has the following form. So we want it to contain tuples where uh, we sort of enumerate the letters of the alphabet. So I have one A, uh, two B, and so on. And I want to uh, have all of the pairs uh, up to uh, 26 uh, Z, like so. So I want to create this using zip and also ranges. Okay, so you should again try to think about this for yourself. Maybe pause the video, try it out in Haskell. Uh, I'm now going to proceed to the solution. So the idea is we want to zip together uh, two different lists. So we see from what we want that the first list should be numbers from one to 26 and the second list should be, well, the letters from A to Z. Now, we already saw before that I can get numbers from one to 26 like this, and I can get uh, the characters from A to Z uh, like this. So now I just need to zip those two things together to get the resulting list of pairs. Okay, so I could do uh, one to 26, and uh, right, then I need uh, characters, oops, A, uh, two characters Z, like so, and I zip them together, and what I get is a uh, list of pairs which enumerates all of the letters in the alphabet. Now, since zip will stop when the shorter list ends, I could have alternatively um, also not specified the upper bound here for the numbers. 
So I could have just said I want to zip together all numbers starting at one with the characters A to Z, and I would get the same result. In fact, we could see what happens if I also don't bound the second part. You see here, uh, well, <laughs> the thing goes on forever. And we see here that the thing it's producing in the second component is actually like a character value which has a specific number. So apparently in Haskell, characters are also unbounded structures. Um, so we have to at least bound one of the lists. But we could have, I guess, also, uh, instead of bounding uh, the characters, we could have also bounded the numbers like so. And in that case, we get the same result as the original exercise demanded. With that, I'll conclude this video. So we've seen some of the most important basic structures of Haskell. Now I'm aware that the examples we've seen so far maybe aren't the most interesting, but they're important in the sense that they'll allow us to build up much more interesting and complicated things if we use these elements. The next video will be much shorter than this one and will introduce you to types and type classes in Haskell. And in fact, that'll be the last ingredient we need before we can move on to writing proper interesting programs.